it boggles your mind when you start to think about these, this whole story of dinosaurs. I mean, what really happened? How are people, you know, recently talking about seeing dinosaurs and encountering dragons and stuff like that? Why are they so worshipped more than anything else? The dragons and all this dragon culture and mythology is everywhere. So we're going to get into that here. So now let's get right into this whole thing. I have a lot of information. Now, the thing is, I really want you to think is dinosaurs. I really want you to think about dinosaurs and everything that that entails. All the information that we have gotten over the years about dinosaurs really get into that. Now, when you think dragons, think dinosaurs. The problem is when most people, you know, think about dinosaurs, they believe dinosaurs are these, you know, beasts, these reptiles that existed millions of years ago before, you know, mankind. And we read stories about, you know, dragons and, you know, dragon slayers and the knights versus the dragons, you know, slaying the dragon to save the princess, all this and that is always found in mythology. And we are led to believe that dragons are these mythological beasts that existed a long time ago and dinosaurs existed millions of years ago. And people think that they, they are just two separate species. You got a dragon species and you got dinosaurs and they are totally separate from each other. For the most part, that is what people think when they think about the two. So now understand, it wasn't until 1824 that we get the word reptile. It wasn't until 1842 that Richard Owens gives us the name dinosaur. So we're talking about 1842, fairly recent in history that we finally get the name dinosaur. Think about that. Now, dinosaur means great lizard. So 1763 is when the first official writings of what we call today dinosaur was recorded. 1763. So when they recorded these writings, they wasn't even calling it dinosaur then because the name didn't come until much later. So when you look at all the ancient stories and depictions about dragons and all these stories about dragons, when you look at all this stuff, you know, before the 17, 1800s, when you look at the pictures and the depictions, these dragons look like dinosaurs and most of the accounts. Now, the thing is, before they was called dinosaurs by, you know, Richard Owen and everybody else, they called them dragons. So think about this. This changes everything. When you understand that before dinosaurs was called dinosaurs, they called them dragons. So think about the mythology. So we're going to say that dinosaurs are real and actually existed and they called them dragons. And then we find all of this mythology and all these stories and tales about dragons. When you have the Chinese put the dragon on the zodiac, everything else on that Chinese zodiac, as I show, is real. And we are to believe that the dragon is mythological. And you have all these prominent people writing about dragons and seeing these things. When you finally understand that they called them dragons before dinosaurs, everything changes. How many people know that? It's some reason why they want to cover this up. We're going to get into that because you have to think that, well, wait a minute. If they call them dragons before dinosaurs, then what about all these stories that we are reading and finding about dragons? So we're going to get into that. So now this gives validity to all of the ancient stories and depictions and understand they have found so many depictions of men walking with dinosaurs a lot of ancient depictions of men talking about dinosaurs and walking with dinosaurs these people drew the dinosaurs how the hell could they draw a dinosaur you know so long ago when we didn't really start discovering fossils until the 1800s they wasn't even written about to the 1700s so if you find depictions drawings of a dinosaur before that that should tell you something that basically is proof positive that men walked with dinosaurs or dragons. It's proof. So then you have to go back and look at these stories and say, well, you know, it's truth to it. But the big question is, why would they lie and tell us that dinosaurs existed millions of years before us and they died out because of some meteor and this and that? And the whole question now becomes, when you think about it, okay, if men walk with these dinosaurs or dragons, 
somehow they became extinct. They're gone. So what happened that killed off these huge dinosaurs, killed them off, but left us alive? And that's something I was getting into in part two. We know it's recorded that some kind of cataclysmic event took place that wiped out a lot of people and perhaps the dinosaurs and, you know, anything that was small enough to survive underground, you know, lived. Is it possible there could have been some dinosaurs that survived underground? Yes. We're going to get into that later because that's that's huge. But think about it. You know, how could something wipe them out and not us? And we got to really, really dig into that question. But the real point I'm trying to make is why cover it up? Why not just tell us, hey, yeah, we existed with these dinosaurs until something happened. They hid the truth for a reason. And when you get into everything that goes along with this, then it gives more validity to this whole reptilian story. It's, it's something that you really have to study is your dragon mythology and everything that we have on dinosaurs. So understand that a lot of these stories are old. This, you know, this whole thing goes back a long time about dragons and it's been so well hidden from, you know, uh, the public. It's not been put out there on the forefront as being fact, just stories that people have found. You know, if you read archaeologist books and you start reading books by paleontologists and they start talking about these stories and the comparison between these dragons and dinosaurs, then you, you, you start to understand. And then you realize that, well, wait a minute, this book is dated 1800s or this book is dated, you know, 1920 or 1930 it's like well wait a minute these stories have been around for a long time and we never heard about them about the comparison between the dragons and these uh, dinosaurs and all the stories the mythologies we are told but the stories of what's going on these people wrote about this stuff so now i want you to start thinking about these first stories being like you know religious stories, the first religious stories or a religious story of some sort. When you start to read a lot of the stories, you always find that the people sacrifice lambs to the dragon. That's one of the most common things you're going to find. Sacrificing lambs to the dragon. There's a story from Krakow, Poland about the uh, Volvo dragon. You have a man named Scuba who basically took a uh, a uh, lamb and he stuffed it with sulfur and he sacrificed it to the dragon. The dragon eats the uh, lamb and it kills him. So this is a story they wrote about. It's another version of this story about King Krakus, his two sons. He had his sons go out and basically uh, slay this dragon. The problem is they argued about who would get the credit for killing this dragon because they knew only one of them could be king. So uh, Leech or Lech, the one son, kills his brother, Krakius II, and he blames it on the dragon. He becomes king and he assumes the throne. Now, later the truth comes out and they banish him. Now, the thing is, they actually have a statue of this Valvo dragon. It's called, it's called Valvo dragon. They pronounce their W's with a V sound. They have this statue there in Krakow, Poland. And the reason why it's called Krakow is supposed to be named after Krakius II, you know, pronounced Krakow. So it's a lot of dragon stories out there, a lot of dragon mythology, but you're always going to find lambs being sacrificed to these dragons. So they had to sacrifice these lambs to the dragon because, of course, if they didn't feed them, then the dragons would come deeper into their towns or villages and start eating people or terrorizing. So they sacrificed the lambs to these dragons. So in sacrificing these lambs to the dragons, these lambs became what? They're saviors. So I know it sounds crazy. It's like, oh, come on. It almost sounds corny. I thought so, too, when I was reading it. So I was like, well, wait a minute. I got to do some more research on this. But when you go and you start researching this, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's not far fetched. It's all over the place of these stories about lambs being sacrificed to these dragons. And it makes sense. Remember, I was talking about in a previous video how the original symbol for Christianity was what? The lamb on the cross, the lamb being the savior. Think about that. So and this also explains why we don't get the image of Christ on the cross until 800 years after the crucifixion. 
Ever since the first day we are born, our body cells is consistently fighting against this radiation, but it also has to fight against microbes and bacteria and viruses and diseases. So our body cells is continually fighting against these things for our entire life. Now, the deeper you go underground, you are not exposed to any of these things because there's a high concentration, a very high level of negative ions. That is the word of the day. Negative ions. Pay attention because this is the, you know, this is the main point I want to make in this entire video. What negative ions is. I don't know what you have been told about them, but you have to understand this. Negative ions play a major role in the cycle of nature on this planet. Period. Point blank. They play a very vital role in our lives. This is something that is not being taught to us. A lot of people remember. Those bands, uh, people used to walk around with supposed to be, you know, dispersing negative ions, whatever like that. You have to really understand what negative ions is. And we're going to really get into that in this video. But underground, negative ions exist. And what negative ions do is they completely wipe out radiation, microbes, you know, viruses and everything like that. They cleanse the body so that your body cells can do what they are meant to do. Your body cells, our body cells are meant to regenerate. Understand something that regenerates can never die because it keeps regenerating, regenerating. This is what uh, negative ions is supposed to do. So underground, it's a high concentration of it. And people, uh, in theory, and you know, not even in theory, really scientifically proven will actually live longer with a high concentration of negative ions because your cells will just regenerate. I want you to think about something. I want you to think about stem cell research. The reason why stem cell research works is because they can do these experiments with the stem cells and the cells have a, let's say, a sterilized environment to work with. Now, when your body cells, as I said, is not fighting anything. They do their job and that is to regenerate you. So this is why stem cell research work. I also want you to think about cancer patient patients. When they go get the chemotherapy uh, treatment, what happens is there's a high concentration of radiation, you know, emitted to, uh, you know, the tumor or the cancer is part of their body. And what happens is their body cells, you know, it basically come together and fight hard because it has to fight off that radiation. It tries to fight it off. This is why, like, when they finish the whole treatments, they are completely weak and, you know, they're tired. They start losing their hair because the cells, uh, you know, that's basically holding the sh your strands of hair together have to basically go to the energy used to fight off this bombardment of radiation to your body. So if you get weak, you start losing your hair and they have to use a high concentration of radiation you know, to shrink the tumor, but it takes a toll on your body. And this is why some people don't die from, you know, the cancer, they die from the radiation. And this has been proven. So, you know, our body cells are meant, whoever created us, understand this, our body cells were meant to basically heal us. And to, you know, the implications is if your body cells is doing its job, you should be living on this planet for thousands of years. But there are other things that's keeping that from happening. We're going to get into in this video. Now, also, I want you to think about trees. Think about the fact that there are some trees that live thousands of years. If a tree is in the right location and has the right supply of resources, we talk about sunlight, you know, a good, uh, you know, channel of water underground that they can tap into, or if it rains a lot in that area, if they can get their roots deep enough, we know trees can live for hundreds and thousands of years. Now, what some researchers in Australia and Queensland uh, University uh, in Brisbane, Australia, who did some uh, research on trees and plants that they say, you know, basically was electrifying the atmosphere. Now, listen to this. And this is from Queensland University of Technology. It says plants have long been known as the lungs of the earth, but a new finding has found they may also play a role in electrifying the atmosphere. Scientists have long suspected an association between trees and electricity, but researchers in Australia think that they have finally discovered the link. The scientists ran experiments in six locations around Brisbane. They found the positive and negative ion concentration in the air 
were twice as high in heavily wooded areas than in open grassy areas such as parks. Now, I want you to understand what this is saying. It is saying that the trees are pulling the negative ions out of the air. They don't really want the positive ions, even though they're going to be there. They want the negative ions because the negative ions is going to sustain them. Now, trees, plants are living things just like we are. So if they're pulling the negative ions out of the air into their atmosphere and using it to sustain themselves and keep themselves, you know, going for years, centuries, millennia in many cases, this is something you need to think about because it's, it's really deep and what's going on. Understand, as I said, this is a natural cycle. This is what's supposed to happen. The negative ions keep them alive. It's that simple. Now, understand the key to this whole thing is water. Water is the key. Now, we're talking about basically uh, the effects of negative ions on the body and a consistent level of negative ions would sustain the body. We're talking about the fountain of youth here. This is why the fountain of youth, you know, always was a fountain. It had to deal with water because water is the key to this thing. So now you have to have this steady supply a continuous, infinite supply of negative ions to basically sustain you for, you know, who knows how long. Unless somebody blow your brains out, you would basically, in essence, live forever. So you had this bacteria going from bacteria, you know, into fish eventually and tadpoles and frogs and lizards to megalodon and T-Rex and stegosaurus. So, you know, you would think, for it to go from, you know, small organisms to more complex organisms to these giants, you would expect to see more giants. Now, they tell us that the atmosphere was so humid and it created the conditions that uh, sustained and created these giant reptiles. But you would still expect to see other giants, you know, on the planet as well. You know, we don't find that. We find these giant um, dinosaurs. And the whole thing is fishy with that anyway, because we know that they lied to us about dinosaurs from the jump, since we can prove now that dinosaurs and humans did coexist. So the whole timeline is kind of, you know, out of whack. And we really don't know what's going on with that uh, when it's talking about dinosaurs. We know they possibly did exist as long ago as they say, but maybe they all wasn't wiped out uh, the way that they tell us with a meteor and all that, because we know that humans and these dinosaurs coexisted or uh, coexisted or uh, humans are much older than they are telling us. So we're not really going to get into that whole thing. The problem is, you know, and we what I'm getting into here is the um, the fact the evolutionary scale that they give us for us, for humans, for life. So if you had cyanobacteria for 3.5 billion years on its own, on this planet, then all of a sudden evolving into these super complex organisms and these mega giant reptiles, you know, you know, what's up with that? And the thing that really exposes this thing is Pangea. And if you heard of Pangea, Pangea is basically the landmass that came about, uh, you know, through the formation of, of the planet or whatever. So basically at one point you had this one large landmass called Pangea. So this basically all of the continents connected together was Pangea. Now Pangea had life. It sustained life. But the problem with Pangea was it had multiple volcanoes. So you had so many volcanoes together erupting simultaneously, and it released a lot of these deadly gases into the atmosphere. It completely changed the Earth's atmosphere, and it wiped out 95% of all life on the planet. Gone. And we know eventually... Uh, they would separate and we would get our continents and everything like that. But you had 95% of life on Earth wiped out. And then it only took 30 million years for life to start to come back, for the Earth to recover. So how we go from 3.5 billion years of bacteria to basically back to nothing, to no bacteria except for certain locations, but then life recreating itself in 30 million years. The numbers, it don't add up. It shouldn't took so fast. Uh, it shouldn't happen so fast for life to recover um, after that 
cataclysmic event. So the numbers don't add up. And there's a lot of scientists in agreement on that of uh, what happened for life to recover so fast. So this is why many of us are so hooked on the fact that something was introduced to this planet to create these more complex organisms. Now, Pangaea existed uh, 300 million years ago. So, um, you know, it's separated into the continents we know today. You know, a few times these land masses broke up and separated. The problem is, you know, the dating. And you got to understand, they give us these long, crazy dates, a billion, you know, years of evolution, 100, 600 million years and stuff like that. So we don't really question evolution. And so we can say, well, it takes this amount of time for things to evolve. And this is why we're not seeing evolution. But that don't make any sense when you tell us, you know, 3.5 billion years for bacteria to go from bacteria and to eventually dinosaurs. You know, that's a long time. And then we get life uh, basically recreating itself in 30 million years. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't fit, especially when you remember that we're talking about under different uh, atmospheres, different circumstances. So we can say that, OK, well, maybe the uh, atmosphere speed sped life up. But if that was the case, then you would expect to see uh, more animals, the, the evolution of animals in different places. And I'm going to get into that, what I mean by that. But the thing is this, the problem that you would have with this whole thing. This is the problem I have with it when you, because listen, this is something that I spent a lot of years of my life on really digging into all of this, because to me, this is the key. If you want to start with what we getting into now, to me, you have to go here. If you really want to look into all the mystery and everything like that, this should have been the first thing you, you was looking at. You should have been looking at evolution. You should have been looking at what they tell us, because my problem with evolution with the whole thing, no matter how much sense that it made and added up to in a lot of places, is the fact that science tells us that we evolve from cyanobacteria. So we're talking about cyanobacteria eventually becoming these primates that we eventually evolve from. So that would mean what, people? There is no God. There is no creator. There's just this. There is no purpose to all of this. It's just something that was created out of a supernova, an explosion that happened. And through um, through various climate changes and circumstances, we just so happened to pop into existence as a result of evolution. Can't accept that. That's something I couldn't accept. And when I got to this point, I was stuck. And I remember this. This is one of the hardest things that I was stuck on because it fit. And when you're reading all the books and all the books are saying the same thing. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Then, you know, why y'all tell us about this Bible shit? One minute y'all telling us we just evolved from primates. And then y'all give me this book that's talking about this holy God that created everything. What the fuck is going on? So, you know, to people like me and, and you, if you really go crazy over information like that and you really got to do research. Yeah, that, that shit had me snapping. So I had to really look and I dedicated a lot of time to this, to really looking into this because I wanted to be sure because to me, it makes a lot of sense at first because it explains a lot. It explained the whole thing. Well, this is why we don't see God. This is why no God has came down and did anything because, you know, we, just evolve from nothing. We are so insignificant that whatever the super God that created us don't really give a shit because, you know, you don't care about the bacteria that's growing on the ocean floor. It can do whatever the hell it wants. I don't even really know it exists or what it looked like. So what? I'm so much on a higher scale of existence. Whatever that stuff is doing, I don't care. And little do we know bacteria on the ocean floor could be going through a whole bunch of political shit that we have no clue about. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but who knows on the, in the scheme of things, we're talking about ultra small and huge. So it was something that blew me away and I couldn't accept it because of the power of the spirit, the soul consciousness. This is something that is so super advanced. And it just took me, you know, uh, getting some more education to figure out what's going on. And we're going to get into that because I want you guys to know. 
So evolution is what they tell us. And they stuff the Bible down our throat so we know it's all bullshit. So we got to look at this whole evolutionary scale and see where the problem lies. And of, and of course, it's a problem. It's a major problem when we get into these primates. Because when we get into the primates, we look at the evolutionary chart and we can see, you know, you have primates coming, uh, evolving and, uh, basically you have gorillas and chimps still being here on this planet. But then when we get over to, uh, Homo, uh, Australopithecus, how you pronounce it, I think <laughs> this is a big issue right here because they have a link connecting these two and that link should not be there. Now we're going to get back into this chart. Now it's because I remember when I got to this point of evolution, I was just thinking about, damn, how smart animals are. And it's like, well, then animals became smart fast. When you think about cyanobacteria, you know, 3.5 billion years of existence. And then all of a sudden they become these super intelligent, you know, organisms. So you have to understand what it takes to become an evolved uh, complex organism. Now, in order for this bacteria to really evolve, it has to get with the other cyanobacteria and agree to live together, to agree to uh, share food. But the most important part is it had to agree to this complex developmental uh, program, which basically uh, is going to redirect cells to different parts of the body to do specific jobs. Now, when you think about how complex uh, even the animal body is in our body, we got lungs to breathe and a heart and everything like that and all kinds of organs, our pancreas, our, you know, our liver and everything. It's different uh, cells that make up these different organs and everything. So uh, we want to get into that. But um, this is the type of sophistication that your these organisms will have to have in order for it to go from these single cell, you know, eat and poop uh, organisms to something more complex. So we're talking about uh, a long process of evolution that will have to take place and it will have to take consciousness. They have to take these uh, single cells being conscious of their, of their situation. And uh, they will have to agree to evolve. This is something that's going to take everybody agreeing on because what's going to have to happen also is they will have to basically kill any bacteria that could not evolve because you don't want them uh, reproducing um, organisms that's going to be the same, that's not going to evolve into um, the new species because you want evolution to happen because this is something um, you would have to really agree to happen. So the thing is, when um, we look at Pangea, Pangea, the, all these animals was wiped out. And um, 30 million years later, you had new animals come into existence. The problem is we're talking about 3.5 billion years of this cyanobacteria in existence. Now, 3.5 billion years, nothing but bacteria. We should not find any life on a planet during that time. And we do. We did. So you had scientists discover these bugs and they date them to 3.7 billion years ago. So this is before cyanobacteria. Now, even if you want to say maybe the numbers might be off, you got to look at that number. 3.7 billion years was uh, before cyanobacteria. And remember, it still took another billion years or so for life, for basically, you know, something to crawl out of the waters and, um, you know, begin to walk around. So that's another billion years tacked on to that. You have PBS and CNN doing a story on this, on how they found the fossilized remains of these bugs that existed 3.7 billion years ago. Um, this is a problem. <laughs> and also, we know our atmosphere cannot really sustain life uh, 2.5 billion years ago. So we shouldn't find really no kind of organism uh, that can crawl around or walk around and live on the surface uh, more than 2.5 billion years ago. And again, if no humans or no kind of intelligent life was walking around on the surface of the planet 2.5 billion years ago, then, you know, who created these? And these spears, uh, they find 
uh, in South Africa. They date them to about 2.8 billion years. They also found similar spheres in uh, Utah dating 2.5 million years. And we know about the spheres in Costa Rica and also in Bosnia. And we found all over the planet these spheres that don't nobody really know uh, what they are. People thought for one reason it was formed from something naturally. But the lines is what give it away. These you know lines around these spheres. Now, it's not 100 percent, um, you know, uh, it's supposed to be 100% proven that the the age of these spheres, but of course, not everybody agree. But the fact that we find these spheres in so many different places, it's hard for people to just discount them. And, you know, that's a huge number to be, you know, way off of 3.7 billion years. So, I mean, I, I doubt they off a billion years or 500 million years or what have you. Even if they're off a billion years, it's still, uh, it's weird because, um, Something had to create these spheres and we know it couldn't have been it had to be some kind of intelligent life to do that. And no humans was supposed to be here uh, that long ago. So this is something that you have to factor into the whole process when we're looking at everything. And you have to say, well, what the fuck is this?